That was Rod Rosenstein announcing, yeah, Mueller indicting 13 Russian uh, trolls that had tried to impact the 2016 election. It's not really new news, but now having some specificity does certainly help a lot. Um, what has the whole Uranium One deal been about? That we knew 18 months before 2010 when they finally, CFIA signed off on the Uranium One deal that gave Putin and the Russians 20% of our uranium. Well, what did we discover in the course of the last year that nobody else wanted to report? That there was bribery, extortion, kickbacks, money laundering all committed on U.S. soil and that we had a spy within the organization now known as the informant that has now testified before three congressional committees telling our own government what this what Putin and Russia were up to well that was 20, 2009 and now this is 2016 and the, the only shock I have is that everybody's acting so shocked I'm not shocked you know we knew about the Google and Facebook ads and you know but simultaneously you know Rod Rosenstein describing they're running a, a pro-Trump and anti-Trump rally in the same city in the same day for crying out loud. The one thing that didn't come out of these indictments today, it has nothing to do with the Trump campaign. Frankly, nothing to do with any one American willingly uh, working with the Russians in any way. This was an elaborate scheme. They wanted to sow as much discord in this country as they possibly could. And they did everything imaginable and paid any amount of money to do it. Joining us now with reaction, we have Greg Jarrett, Fox News legal analyst, Sarah Carter, investigative reporter, and Fox News uh, analyst as well. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, let's start with you from the legal side, Greg Jarrett. I don't see any evidence of Trump-Russia collusion again. Absolutely, you're right. This has, as you stated, nothing to do with the Trump campaign and allegations of collusion. However... It would be a mistake for anybody to think that uh, Robert Mueller, the special counsel, is now suddenly shifted away from Donald Trump. Um, all you have to do is look at the dozens and dozens of people at the White House and elsewhere that he has interviewed, and he has been talking to them about the president's conduct uh, and the campaign's conduct uh, before the election. And, you know, Mueller but and you his would team... See, you would think, I mean, when he said that no American had any knowledge of what the Russians were doing, and he goes through the, the, the big announcement today, you're right, this is completely separate and apart. And we've been at this now. There's never been any evidence presented up to this point at all right. that I know of of Trump-Russia collusion, is there? No, but this was a way for Mueller to say, see, look... My uh, special investigation is legitimate. I'm finding evidence of wrongdoing related uh, to the election. And, you know, I have here in front of me the appointment of special counsel signed by Rod Rosenstein when he named Mueller. And there's two parts to it. You know, investigate Russia's efforts to interfere in the election. But the second part, any collaboration or coordination between the Russians and President Donald Trump's campaign. So... The second part of the investigation is still ongoing, is completely unrelated to what happened today, which honestly is just small potatoes. Sarah Carter, your thoughts? I think Greg brought up several really important points, uh, and but my thoughts, I wasn't surprised either, Sean, on on this uh, indictment. I would, I, I think the only part that surprised me is how you know they, they listed the number of people, all of them, of course. Outside of the United States now, they're going to possibly try to get uh, some kind of extradition and have these people face justice. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, you got to think of it this way. This was an operation run by the Russian government, by the FSB, which is their new KGB, right? And this was an operation to sow discord. And I think, I think the important part here for most Americans to understand is that Russia had no game in this as far as like as far as Trump was concerned President Trump I know that a lot of people in the media tried to play up and they did this collusion between President Trump and the Russians and they were looking for some kind of evidence to prove this and we saw a number of false fake stories out in the news media some stories which had to be retracted immediately others which were proven false 
as the months progressed. Um, and, and I think this indictment stipulates that, that they are, that there was no evidence there that, uh, there was anybody knowingly working with the Russians on this. Another important point here, Sean, is that the Russians were just, and this is according to a number of people that were working during that time in the campaigns, both in the Hillary Clinton campaign and in the Trump campaign, the Russians were very concerned about, uh, incoming candidate President, you know, President Trump, because they couldn't engage him. They couldn't figure him out. He was an oddity to them. Uh, they were constantly trying to garner how, how this man was going to operate with them if he became president. And even when he did become president, the Russians wanted to sow discord. And guess what? Guess who helped the Russians? It was the media to a large extent, and and our own political partisan uh, fighting, and this was this was what they intended to do. This is what people aided them with, and now we've spent the last year of uh, the first year of President Trump's presidency, basically battling out in the media, in the U.S. public, uh, this idea that somehow President Trump and his campaign were colluding with the Russians. And what we have discovered is that on its face, there is absolutely no evidence showing that. It is a lie. And in the end, the people that pushed that forward and pushed that disinformation forward basically made the last year uh, an impossibility and gave the Russians what they wanted. This is how up to their eyeballs they were in terms of their use of social media and platforms, and the indictment goes into all of this today, but, you know, they created thematic group pages all over social media sites, and I'm reading directly from the indictment, particularly on social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and organization-controlled pages addressed a range of issues, including immigration, where groups like Secured Borders, the Black Lives Matters movement, quote, blacktivist, uh, religion with groups uh, including United Muslims of America, the Army of Jesus, uh, or Southern United and Heart of Texas, and what they were doing was really trying to sway the minds of the American people. One interesting thing is they conclude there was no impact on the 2016 election that they can discern at all, though, Greg. You're right. And you know, look, part of the problem is that our social media uh, websites and platforms are so open. Anybody can uh, conjure a fake name in an account. And so it's ripe for abuse. That needs to be corrected because, frankly, that was the only way the Russians could see that they could try to sow discord and influence the election. Uh, but but it wasn't enough. Uh, you, you know, they, they had, what, 80 or so people working in this particular office and so they were spreading, you know, false information apparently on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, whether it had any measurable impact, I doubt very much. It was a small opera. I mean, we have 325 million Americans, most of them adults, a lot of them vote. Uh, you can't reach all of those people, you know, with an operation of less than 100 people and fake uh, identities and well they did have some impact i mean Mm -hmm. um now we go back to the investigators uh, themselves and and you have an unbelievable piece out sarah about andrew weissman that you've broken Oh, yes. I, I didn't know if you were going to go in that direction, uh, Sean. Uh, but I do want to make one point before we go to Andrew Weissman. I really believe that, you know, if you just look at the indictment itself and know how the Russians operate, they weren't trying to, in an essence, affect the election to get any particular candidate to win. I don't believe that whatsoever. I think they were just trying to sow that discord and chaos and kind of throw our country into this tumultuous, uh, well, what we're in right now, a special counsel investigating the president, all of these lies spewed across the media, stories coming left and right from everywhere and, and confusing the American public. So I think, if anything, that's, that's where they succeeded. Um, Andrew Weissman, it's, it's really fascinating, you know, uh, I we look at the special counsel and we see all the different players and there's been a lot of stories out there that we, we know that more at least half of the special counsel were Democratic donors 
And Andrew Weissman is somebody who's come up in the media several times. He had a lot of support for, apparently, for Hillary Clinton. Apparently, he attended her victory party. But there was a lot about his past that we didn't know. And one of the interesting things about Andrew Weissman that I discovered was that he was actually reported to the Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz a year before the presidential elections. And he was actually reported by a lawyer for whistleblowers who believed that Andrew Weissman's actions in the court in the past showed egregious a uh, criminal what he, they, he believed to be uh, withholding legal evidence, actions, corrupt legal practices. I, I want to get to the whole list here, but uh, including withholding evidence, but not just in one case, but in Correct. multiple cases. Uh, yes, all right, in, in multiple cases. All right, we're going to hit all of this tonight. Uh, Hannity, nine Eastern, on the Fox News Channel. Also, we have the Daily Caller report and uh, new information emerging about Michael Flynn uh, and his judge that I find fascinating. <laughs> And as we continue with Sarah Carter and Greg Jarrett, we'll have a lot more on all of this. The breaking news story, Mueller indicting 13 Russians. No evidence that any American uh, willingly participated in this. And the idea apparently was to just sow as much discord as possible uh, in the United States for the 2016 uh, elections. And also we have the other news about Andrew Weissman, Sarah's column. So he was caught, Andrew Weissman, the top deputy of Robert Mueller, on multiple occasions trying to withhold exculpatory evidence evidence in very important high-profile cases. Well, uh, explain what happened and why would Mueller appoint this guy? Well, this is what Mueller would appoint him because he came up the ranks with Robert Mueller. Remember, he was the general counsel for Robert Mueller in the FBI and was very close and still is obviously very close to Mueller. You know, the nickname he got was Pip, you know, a Pit Bull, you know, Mueller's Pit Bull. And the New York Times uh, addressed that in a story, an expose they did on Weissman. But what's really fascinating about Weissman is that he's described by a lot of attorneys that I've spoken with as somebody who's willing to do anything, cut corners, do whatever it takes to try to win a case. And one of the attorneys that went on the record to speak about Andrew Weissman and who did blow the whistle uh, with his clients to the IG and as well as to the Senate Judiciary Committee even a decade ago uh, is a man by the name of David Schoen. And here's somebody who has no political leanings. He doesn't belong to any political party. In fact, he worked with the ACLU in Alabama, um, has been awarded all kinds of things for his liberal activism, and he's a criminal defense attorney. And what's fascinating, he says, is that during the, a lot of the cases that Weissman handled while he was in New York, in the Eastern District of New York, there were immeasurable complaints about Weissman and how how he All right, I want to pick this up. I, I, stay right there. Sarah Carter, her blockbuster report, just how unbelievably uh, disturbing the, the track record of Andrew Weissman happens to be. Also more on our top story, Mueller indicting 13 Russians. No evidence of collusion. That is the big takeaway of all of it, that Russians trying to promote discord. After all our reporting on Uranium One, why anybody would be surprised is beyond me. And we'll get to your calls in the next half hour as well. Straight ahead as we continue, Hannity tonight at 9. Full details on the Fox News Channel. News and information I promise you won't get from the mainstream media. He never stops working for the good of the country. Sean Hannity with behind-the-scenes information on today's breaking news. Hannity is on right now. All right, 25 till the top of the hour. If you're just joining us, two big stories we're really following today. We'll have full coverage on Hannity tonight at 9, the indictment of 13 uh, Russians. The biggest takeaway from the indictment here is that the scheme that was elaborate, well organized and funded was designed to sow discord in the 2016 election. It seemed that it didn't matter. They even had simultaneous rallies, pro-Trump, anti-Trump going on the same day, and uh, it was fairly sophisticated. Does this mean the Mueller investigation is over? Is our own Greg Jarrett is saying absolutely not. And the other story we're following is the FBI missed a second, even more specific tip on this Florida shooter. Um, and we have Sarah Carter. She has a website, sarahacarter.com, and she has an incredible column about Andrew Weissman, the lead prosecutor appointed by Robert Mueller. And uh, Greg Jarrett is with us, Fox News legal analyst, and he knows an awful lot about Weissman and Mueller as well. I'm going to let Sarah finish her story. So Andrew Weissman has this track record of withholding exculpatory 
information. He's the guy yes. that lost tens of thousands of jobs for people that were working at Anderson Accounting. He was overturned in the U.S. Supreme Court 9-0. He put Merrill executives away for a year, four of them, uh, only to be overturned by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. But I think the judge's excoriating of, of Weissman speaks volumes. And the question is, Sarah, why... Why was he appointed by the special counsel? I guess that's a question that the special counsel would have to answer. And I, I believe it's because, you know, he's deemed by those closest to him the guy that's going to do anything to get anything to get an indictment. And that's kind of a terror. If that is the case, that's a, that's a really terrible reason. And it's a reason why he was reported. I think in the story, what makes this story so significant is for the first time we were able to get our hands on this document that actually a judge tried he goes right after Weissman and basically reprimands him. He says Weissman's conduct in a case that happened in 1997, this is the case that made Weissman Weissman, right? This is the one that launched his career. Uh, Judge Sifton, Judge Charles Sifton in the Eastern District of New York, specifically state that Weissman's conduct and his myopic, myopic withholding of information and reprehensible is reprehensible and subject perhaps to appropriate disciplinary measures. At that point in time, they wanted to report Weissman to the bar. He withheld information that the judge and that the defendants believed was necessary exculpatory information from the courts. And this is what's so incredible, that despite that, he had enough allies behind him, Sean, to basically get them to write a letter to the judge according, now this is allegedly according to the attorneys that I spoke with, was able to strong arm this judge into withdrawing his name from this complaint. And then they reissued a new complaint. But we've seen both of the complaints. I have, it's actually on my website, the original complaint complaint against Weissman. By the way, it's Sarah A. Carter. Com. Okay. Stood, he yeah, might go have ahead. been pulled. Greg, no, Greg, that original Greg, complaint stayed, yeah. he might have been reported to the bar. All right. Greg, you also have looked hard at the special counsel and the appointments by Robert Mueller. I think you're equally disturbed at the appointment of Andrew Weissman as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Weissman is a notorious lawyer. He's known for abusive tactics. He weaponizes the law. He's ruthless and unprincipled. And there are, you could fill volumes with the complaints that have been filed to judges and the bar and the Department of Justice. He's been accused of hiding evidence, threatening witnesses. Innocent people have been victimized by this guy. And as you've pointed out on your, your show, his biggest cases have been reversed by higher courts. He drove Arthur Anderson out of business only to have the case uh, smacked down by the U.S. Supreme Court. By the way, tens of thousands of people, real people, lost their jobs there. That's right. But Weissman was undeterred. Then he goes after Merrill Lynch executives, putting them behind bars destroying their lives. That case also reversed by the Fifth Circuit. So it, why did Mueller pick him? Because he knew what he was getting. He wanted that's, a team of partisans with a history of political bias who would be equally determined as Mueller was to undo the results of the presidential election and drive Trump from office. And, you know, Robert Mueller sabotaged his own investigation by picking these partisans. Unbelievable. All right, now I started and we never got into it and I tweeted it out earlier today. I know there might be, you know, I'm watching some of our media colleagues, those that have ignored Uranium One, but, and this was part of, of the investigation that has now gone on a year when we, when Sarah, John Solomon, Greg, you've been a part of it for the year as well. When it was first discovered that there was surveillance, a lack of minimization, there was unmasking of American citizens and even the leaking of raw intelligence, General Flynn, all of, all of which was happening. But we also, a big part of the story was the Uranium One story. And that, you know, Sarah, you, you broke this story with John Solomon, that we literally had Putin's thugs, a network within the United States, Putin operatives in the U.S., we knew because of the informant that you know that testified just in the last two weeks before three congressional committees that the Putin operatives were involved in bribery and extortion and money laundering and kickbacks. And we had an That's informant right. that was telling the FBI and then FBI Director Robert Mueller the whole time. So I, my, just to ask the question, my point is, how can anybody be surprised today, especially when this indictment talks about this effort beginning in 2014, well, we can take back Putin operatives to 2009, 
and how they successfully were able to get a foothold in the uranium market in America. That's right. It, it, it appears that even in the Obama administration, because they were so intent on resetting their operation. Remember, the, the Obama administration didn't get up in arms about the Russians until the election. And, you know, and t- until the election, we didn't hear a peep out of them. In fact, President Obama actually laughed at Mitt Romney at one point when he said Russia was our biggest threat. Well, we've known for a long time the Russian involvement in the United States, particularly with our not just our uranium in- industry, but uh, the spy networks globally, their involvement in the Middle East, their involvement in South Asia. I mean, we've known this forever. We've known this since the fall of the Soviet Union and before that. We've known all of this. It all depends on the politicking. And at that time, even though this informant gave such a valuable counterintelligence information to the FBI and to the CIA and to U.S. agencies like the Department of Energy, they chose to ignore that because it didn't fit their narrative. They wanted to reset with Russia. They wanted a reset to move forward with an Iran deal eventually, and this is what happened. And we saw that going all the way back even into the Clinton administration. There was this need to reset. And we also saw the amount of money. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, Bill Clinton got paid half a million dollars. Like, people don't think about this. That same year that Uranium One deal was set through, he was paid half a million dollars by Renaissance Bank, a Russian bank that was touting the Uranium One deal, that wanted to push that deal forward. They pay Bill Clinton this half a million dollars, not even a peep, and then later in October, they pass the Uranium One. You know, the CFIUS board goes ahead and approves it, despite all this insurmountable evidence that there was real national security risk with this deal. Greg Jarrett, we have talked at length about this, um, and now you see, like, shock and surprise in the hearts of our fellow media people, and I've got to laugh, uh, because they have ignored this and ignored this and ignored this. It seems to me just the natural culmination. You know, I've gotten in trouble once, a number of times, Greg. I've, I've interviewed, unlike others in our industry, I actually took the time, I went to London, I've interviewed on television Julian Assange, and... I've interviewed him multiple times on this radio program. And here's a guy that hacked into NASA when he was 16 years old. He hacked into the DOD when he was 16 years old. He's now in his 40s. At some point, do we not have to look within and say, well, if he did it when he's 16 and he's doing it in his 40s, at what point do we have to look within and say, why are we allowing anybody to have the capability to hack into any system we have? Well, it is a real and legitimate problem. And, uh, you know, the United States government needs to put a stop to it. And there are several ways they can do it. But to pick up on your argument about, you know, Clinton greed and Uranium One, there is strong circumstantial evidence that Hillary Clinton, together with her husband, engaged in an elaborate but well-disguised scheme to peddle influence on a global scale. And Uranium One, you know, was their golden child. I mean, all told, $145 million uh, is estimated to have made its way from shareholders in Russian companies to the Clinton Foundation. And as Sarah pointed out, you know, Bill Clinton made out like a bandit personally uh, after Rosatom announced its takeover of Uranium One, that's the Russian company, and Hillary Clinton, head of CFIUS, approved the deal. Bill goes to Moscow, he meets with Putin, and he gets a nice check for a half a million dollars to deliver an hour-long speech paid for, as Sarah mentioned, by a bank with close ties to the Kremlin and Kremlin and, Kremlin and Uranium One, and the bank right, that was yeah, involved. And, yeah. and the Uranium One bank. You know, I, I just, this to me is what we've all been saying. Now, the only thing that I don't know what happens from here is if, if there's zero evidence of Trump-Russia collusion to this point. But we do have evidence of Hillary Clinton. A, she bought and paid for uh, Russian government lies through her campaign, funneled through a law firm, through the DNC, whose money she was controlling. And then we have, you know, she is one of nine agencies and Syphia is signing off on the Uranium One deal. Then all the money flooded back to the Clinton Foundation with people involved in it. It seems to me that we have an awful lot of Russian influence in in this country, 
And it seems that most of it related to the election, Sarah, was with the Clintons, not with the Trump campaign. Uh, yeah, Sean, I mean, if you're just looking at the facts on their face, I think there's there's three separate investigations here from just what, you know, you brought up. One, there needs to be a thorough, thorough investigation, and we know those are ongoing, into the relationship between people associated with the Clintons, possibly Hillary Clinton herself, you know, few EPS, uh, Christopher Steele, the entire Russian dossier scenario, because that appears to have been part of this FSB dis- disinformation campaign. And secondly, we know now that there is an ongoing investigation into the Clinton Foundation, which appeared to have never been shut down completely. It appears to have resurfaced again. We know they've interviewed a witness um, out of Little Rock. That's actually ongoing right now. And and then thirdly, we have to look at, at the extent of Uranium One and how this past deal with the Russians, how it affected us, who was involved in that, who were the players. Now, I think with Uranium One, it's going to be very interesting because it's going to take a lot of historical uh, deep dives and it's I we know right now the Department of Justice is actually looking into that and I think the uranium one story can crisscross with the foundation story but they may be like two separate two separate things that have the same crossroads if you get what I'm saying so the Clinton Foundation investigation could reveal something new oh and fourth Of course, the investigation right now by Inspector General Michael Horowitz into the FBI's uh, handling of the Clinton server investigation. And and that's going to be so important. Remember, it comes out in the next few weeks. At least that's what we've been told. Unbelievable. And we're going to be watching and waiting. Uh, Greg, did you get an opportunity to, to read all this new information about the judge in the case of Michael Flynn, General Flynn, and how the judge is asking Mueller for specific any evidence he might have at all that might be exculpatory for General Flynn? And this is the same yeah, judge I, that was involved in the Ted Stevens case? I think the judge knows there's exculpatory evidence and wants to see it. This is a this is actually a very, very discerning and skeptical judge, as all judges should be, but aren't. And this judge has a lot of questions for Mueller. And, and my question would also be, wait a minute, on what legal basis did the FBI even have the, uh, the right or authority to question Michael Flynn? Uh, he had committed no crimes. It's not a crime to talk to the uh, Russian ambassador in the transition. It happens all the time in previous transitions. Uh, they had already, through surveillance, uh, listened in on one of uh, Michael Flynn's conversations. So they yeah, knew, they knew everything. Said. And was that was illegal. For questioning him about a conversation right. that, that they knew all about. We're going to have full coverage of this tonight. And the media is so clueless in their coverage. I promise you we're going to break it down. Great work today uh, and all along in this whole year so far. Sarah Carter, Greg Jarrett, you guys have been phenomenal and we'll see you both tonight uh, on Hannity, 9 Eastern on Fox. Thank you both. Um, but this is the most unbelievable story, and the biggest shock in all of this is why anybody's shocked. 